you, Michal, and uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another of uh, our regular series of webinars. Uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, once again, it's the long and the short of it with my, myself, Darren Sindon, and my colleague, Clive Lambert. So let's kick off uh, where we're going to usually kick off here, uh, and that's with a look at the current markets and one of our regular slides, the mood of the markets. What is the mood of the markets currently? Well, I would say it's relief. Um, I think, you know, terrible um, chaos last week, volatility all over the show, um, and then a rally into the close. Uh, and why, the close of the week that is, and why was that? Well, hopes of QE extension and lower rates uh, for longer in the US. However, there are no guarantees here, in my opinion. And it, speaking of opinions, those are very clearly split at the Federal Reserve. Uh, now, we, we, we've got some sound bites to the right here. Charles Plus, the head of the Phil Philadelphia Fed, said interest rates should begin to rise sooner than previously anticipated. Uh, St. Louis Federal Reserve President James Bullard, he, he was the guy who probably saved the markets, he said that the, that, so the Federal Reserve should actually delay the end of QE and consider keeping interest rates lower for longer. And yesterday, Richard Fisher, who's the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve, said no. Uh, he didn't see any reason for the Fed to stop uh, its uh, its plan to end QE, and in fact, uh, he thought the underlying economy was strong. So a difference of opinion there uh, at the Federal Reserve. Markets, for the moment, seem to breathe a sigh of relief and prefer, as they usually do, to look on the upside. I don't think that uh, the volatility has necessarily gone away. I know Clive has been looking closely at equity charts. He might have a slightly different view, but of course, it takes two views to make a market. So. Uh, having a look at another slide in relation to the mood of the markets, you might remember last week uh, when we looked at uh, some of the factors that drive the FX markets, one of the things we talked about were interest rates, and we said then that uh, investors uh, demand a higher interest rate to compensate for a higher risk. Well, here's a clear chart uh, example of that, and this is a chart of uh, Greek 10-year bonds and the yield, i.e. The, the rate of return that they pay to investors to encourage them to hold them. And you can see that they've rallied from around 6.25% uh, at one point to trade uh, at 9% towards the end of last week before falling back to 8 What that's telling you is that uh, the market doesn't, doesn't believe that Greece's problems are sorted, and they're certainly not prepared to lend their money at anything like commercial interest rates. If Greece needs to refinance, which it will do, uh, for, I think I might say April 2015, then uh, it's going to have to pay a, a fairly high interest rate to uh, to, to, to get what it, I think it's 25 billion euros into its coffers. So not looking very likely. The market is risk averse, and it's going to demand a high premium for risky products. Okay, uh, and then looking at uh, our other regular slide sound bites, and here we just try and take a, a snapshot of what. Uh, you know, clever people are thinking about in the market and what they think above the market. Uh, now, everyone's obviously been, been scratching around and looking for a reason for, for the extreme volatility and the big sell-offs we saw last week. UBS uh, amongst them, uh, and the bank basically, you know, sounded a, a sort of a salutary reminder, uh, and it said that uh, the, the, the sell-off last week was a, was a reminder of potentially self-reinforcing fragilities in the world economy. A uh, bit of a mouthful, nonetheless. Uh, it said that uh, these fragilities would take, or do take the following form, weak market trading conditions, fickle investor confidence, vulnerability to shocks, and uneven global growth. But it also pointed out that, uh, that, that uh, it was a, you know, a setup really of the markets I'm making, pointing out there was excessive market positioning, so markets were, were positioned in an extreme fashion, and it was, if, what it saw was a coiled spring of rapid portfolio reallocation. All sounds uh, quite wordy, but basically what he's saying is the market set itself up for a fall, and the catalyst obviously came last week in the form of Eurozone jitters and fears that an ever the pandemic might undermine global growth confidence further. So that's where uh, the market uh, is at the moment, where people are thinking. Obviously, things are, have steadied since the uh, worst bits of last week, but uh, I think there's still a lot of nervousness out there. And in terms of uh, what the money thinks and where people are, are placing their bets, so this is a very interesting slide um, that uh, came across my path yesterday uh, from JP Morgan. Uh, and this chart here shows us uh, where, what, what speculators or how speculators are positioned in the market currently. And what we can see quite clearly is that uh, uh, they're bullish of one particular currency, and that's the one on the far right-hand side of the chart. That is the US dollar. They're flat to slightly bullish uh, on the prospects for cable, 
uh, i.e. A sterling US dollar, but across the board there, uh, from things like the Canadian dollar, the Aussie dollar, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, euro, ruble, New Zealand dollar, and even gold against the US dollar, they are negative. So people are uh, bullish the dollar and bearish uh, everything else. And this is this, as I say, are speculators. So typically hedge funds and large. Uh, speculative traders rather than rather than sort of commercial enterprises businesses and, and private individuals of course Clive made a very good point to me earlier that uh, that, that from his point of view this is, this is almost a screaming out for a, 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 a to take a contrarian view and that one should be perhaps selling into the to the dollar strength and maybe maybe looking to buy it back some of the currencies uh, perhaps even the Brazilian real there out on the left where uh, where people are ultra bearish So let's move on to the meat of today's presentation and today uh, in the long and short of it we're going to be looking at understanding the data, moving on uh, to, uh, to look at uh, different types of individual data and how you can action those in the second part of this webinar which will happen on Thursday. So uh, the next slide then, what is macroeconomic data? Well we touched on this in our last webinar and if you remember we defined it as top-down big picture data that tells us what's going on across the economy of a whole country or region and today in the modern world this data would usually be presented in what's known as a time series format and that's to say it would come in monthly weekly or annual statistics um, data is typically has a longevity and what I mean by that is it will come in, in some kind of historical format so we might have 5, 10 or even 20 years more worth of data of say monthly unemployment trends, consumers or say consumer spending on discretionary items. Uh, now in a modern developed economy uh, these data are usual data points are usually organized under the convention of national accounting and if you like that's the balance sheet for a company the the, uh, the annual report if you will for for how a country is performing um, and this is particularly true for high level accounting statistics such as gross national product national expenditure income as well as other measures of national wealth such as well economic health and trade balances that kind of thing uh, in a modern developed economy, we will likely find an office or bureau of national statistics who collate this data, but they may not always compile it, and that's um, becoming more and more the case that uh, the, the, but, uh, private industry and uh, individuals are compiling data as well as uh, the gov government departments. Now, in terms of uh, some examples of these, uh, these offices of national statistics, we have just that here in the UK known as the ONS and there's a, a link there to their website and in the EU as another example there is Eurostat and I you know, urge you to have a look at those websites particularly if you are interested in stats as I am, there's hours of, uh, of, of, of diversion to be had there and some very interesting data points, also lots of stuff that's not very interesting as well but I'll leave it to you to have a little wander around and, and and a, a dig down into the, the data that's available there. So why does macroeconomic data matter? Well, we've already seen that uh, macroeconomic data is one of the key drivers of the FX and other markets, but why is that so? Why is that so? Well, standardized, and this is the key I think, standardized macroeconomic data allows for a direct comparison of national and regional economies. So you, you can, we talk about in the UK comparing apples with apples and if you've got two sets of data from two countries, two regions or you know, two states, whichever, uh, and you can compare those, that data side by side, you can draw a direct comparison uh, between those two economies. It's a very useful and powerful tool. But furthermore, if we have got time series or historical data, this allows us to look back over time and discover trends and correlated behaviour. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you, you know, you could look back and see how, uh, for argument's sake, UK consumers uh, spent money when uh, interest rates were high. Now, you might think perhaps that they'd pull in their belts, but maybe that wouldn't be the case. Perhaps, in fact, they spent more money because typically when the interest rates are high here in the UK, house prices rise and people uh, feel wealthier because their biggest asset has risen in value. 
Um, the collection of this and collation and comparison of this type of data is what we might what we might now term structural or integral <coughs> to modern markets. So it will be very hard to imagine the modern marketplace without these key uh, data points. In fact, you know, it's getting to the point now where there's almost a surface of data, too much data almost for us to take in. But this isn't necessarily a new thing, the collection of data. In fact, the, uh, the collection of data about a state or economy, the citizens and enterprises within it, is as old as civilization itself. And it's actually responsible for some fairly significant parts of human uh, development. Um, and I say that, but it sounds quite a bold statement, but when you, when you realize that cuneiform and other early forms of writing came about as a direct result of attempts to record details of harvests and taxes in areas like the Fertile Crescent and the wider Middle East in Egypt and China, then I think you'll realize just how important uh, this you know, collection of, of this macro data actually has been. Um, the Roman Empire coined the term census to describe the collection of data about its subjects and dominions, but the ancient Egyptians and Greeks had already established a precedent for record keeping many hundreds of years before. So wherever there's been civilization, wherever people have congregated together and developed, uh, then there's been an, an impetus to, to collect records and try and uh, you know, get to know more about, the, uh, about those people and about that uh, civilization. Now, national censuses are still, or censi perhaps I should say, are still common today. And in the UK, the 2011 census marked the 210th anniversary of the first census that was carried out in modern Britain in 1801. So, you know, records go back at least that far, and in some cases, further still. Now, as economies prospered and empires grew, as we've already seen, they wanted to know more. And that's particularly true, they wanted to know more about themselves, about the people, the businesses, the subjects, whatever, uh, within, within the empire. Um, and the Industrial Revolution and the, and the expansion of the British Empire, which went hand in hand with, with the Industrial Revolution, uh, really spurred the growth in both the amount of data collected and the types of data that people decided to keep records of. Now, the British East India Company, one of the world's first joint stock companies, grew from humble beginnings into an enormous bureaucracy, and it employed hundreds of clerks or writers uh, to record details about its dealings in India and the peoples and trade under its influence between 1757 and 1858, when the, when the, the rule of, of India, if you will, passed out of the hands of the uh, East India Company and into what would become known as the British Raj, and that lasted until 1947 uh, when we had uh, Indian independence and the Indian Civil Service took over. But ostensibly, the, the same organization that uh, was set up in 1757 to record all these details formed the basis of the Indian Civil Service today. Now, once you've got all this data, you can use it. And the key here is the collection of data allowed authorities to know their countries and regions for the first time. And why was that important? Well, because they were able to make predictions and plans based on that data. Be it, and this, you know, this makes a, a big deal of difference. Be it the amount of grain they needed to feed the country, the number of young men that could be called up in times of war, or indeed the level of taxes that the population might be able to support. Once they had that data in front of them, it removed the guesswork, whereas they didn't know, you know the number of people in the country. They didn't have any idea about how, how much grain was grown. They couldn't make uh, any kind of accurate uh, assumptions for, and any kind of planning. In essence, the collection of statistics and, and this key data removed guesswork, although obviously there could still be issues with the accuracy of the data collected, uh, its collation and its interpretation. And Well, people lie, they try to underplay perhaps the amount of grain, gold or you know, other valuable assets that they've got. Uh, people could misfill a form or the data could be collected and taken down wrong, it could be missorted and it and potentially it could be misinterpreted. In the modern age, uh, there are many, we'll come, to, come more onto this in the next uh, of our webinars, but in the modern age there have been plenty of techniques for sifting out that data and we'll look at how you can draw some conclusions from relatively small data sets that can be applied to a whole country. 
one thing I should point out though is that creating statistics before the age of machines was a very laborious uh, and manual process and it took, it, it took people hundreds of, of uh, man hours to collate statistics on a national basis and turn them into usable uh, formats. Of course we live in a computer driven age now and we're uh, very lucky to have this kind of information at our fingertips should we require it. Now as I said earlier that there are literally thousands of these uh, global macro data points um, and there are probably more being uh, take, you know, collected each day and added, and added to, the, uh, to the wider universe and obviously far too many to go into on a singular basis here but what we can probably do is start to look at things from a, again from a, if you like, a top down view of macro data and, and probably break them into, down into three or four distinct types of uh, data points. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but uh, you know it will serve our purposes uh, quite well, I think. So firstly, we'll look at, we'll think about things which are annual and semi-annual in nature. And what I mean here are things such as gross domestic product GDP, or government borrowing requirements, budgetary deficits, surpluses, or gross tax revenues, for example. And those are stats that would tend to be uh, expressed on an annualized basis, and you know, at best perhaps a semi-annualized ba basis, i.e., twice a year. And even where some of these uh, data points are calculated over shorter time frames, for instance, uh, gross domestic product or GDP in the U.S., those figures are typically calculated monthly, but the actual total figure uh, is expressed on a per annum basis. So when you see a figure that says U.S. GDP grew in September by 3.4%. It's not suggesting that over the course of the year, the US economy is going to grow by 36%. What it's saying is, based on the September data, the US economy is growing at 3.4% per annum. So, uh, from, moving on from annual and semi-annual, we've got monthly and weekly data points. Uh, now, uh, m monthly data points would be something perhaps such as unemployment rates, uh, or how housing starts or even perhaps mortgage lending statistics and weekly data well, there's, there's more and more of this perhaps in the US than anywhere else but something for instance like initial jobless claims is a weekly data point that comes out every Thursday at 1.30 and that's a very good example of, uh, of just such a weekly data item very similar often you know in terms of, uh, of the nature of data to the annual and semi-annual data just the frequency changes so the third set of data points is, is a relatively new kid on the block, um, and this is survey-based data. Now this used to be more of an ad hoc thing, and it was commissioned probably really by companies and individuals in, in the form of market research, but as, uh, as time's gone by, uh, market research has gained a good deal of credence and traction, uh, these kind of survey-based data points are, are moving away from the ad hoc nature and becoming more standardized. And so and a very good example of a survey based data point that, uh, that's got a lot of traction, a lot of credence, would be the HE, HSBC flash PMI data for China. That's the producing managers index, sorry, purchasing managers index rather, uh, the data for China. We won't worry too much about what individual data points are today. We'll but we will talk about that in more depth on Thursday. Um, other examples of uh, survey-based data, various consumer confidence figures, and uh, you know, cornerstone uh, old-fashioned market research surveys, if you will, such as Ipsos Mori's Captains of Industry Survey, where they, they talk to 200 or so uh, leaders of, uh, of global industry and ask them what they're thinking. But the newest entrant into, uh, into the data universe, if you will, is is one that's come about uh, through the advent of social media and that's what I think we can label sentiment or crowd-based data. This is data, as I say, is extracted from social media and other electronic communication networks. Uh, as I say, it's a new kid on the block but I think it's one that we're going to hear a lot more about going forward. Uh, again, it's something that we'll talk about in greater depth on Thursday but uh, some very interesting work being done in that field and what that's going to really mean in essence is going to bring down the time scales perhaps uh, between uh, something happening and uh, and us being able to draw an inference about its impact on the market. So th amongst all this data, what matters and to whom? Well, different data points have different levels of market impact and they'll also have uh, a different relevance and importance to, to different groups of people. 
but uh, if you look for instance at something like non-farm payrolls which is still one of the very most important statistics that the market chooses to look at this is a, me a monthly measure of US unemployment and this is a figure carries much greater weight than say the monthly net investment flows into the EU uh, the payrolls data is is considered to be very important by short-term traders and, and the reason for that is very straightforward it's that uh, the payrolls numbers that deviate from the consensus estimates, the estimates that what uh, most analysts are thinking or numbers that are revised and they are subject to revision so you know in, with September's number might come a revision for say the August figure those revisions and those deviations from consensus move markets sharply and they create trading opportunities and that's obviously what we're really all interested in discovering. But longer term traders would be more interested in, in looking beyond the initial headline figure, the 184 or 155,000 jobs, whichever the number is. And they'll, be, they'll like to drill down into the data points uh, that, that lie behind the headline and non-farm payrolls number, such as average hourly earnings, unemployment rate, labor participation, and in particular, they want to look at the trends and the rates of change in any or all of those above. So maybe again, the individual headline number of any of those is not, not so important to uh, a longer term trader. What they are concerned about is what the impact of that particular number is on the long term trend for any of those numbers. And again, they might look back historically to see what the, what, what the, the back data can tell us about what's likely to happen into the future. So um, moving on to the sort of final, um, if you like, definition uh, or distinction of, of, of the types of, of uh, macroeconomic data that we get. And this is um, to draw the distinction between leading and lagging uh, data or indicators. Uh, it's quite an important uh, uh, distinction, particularly when you're, in, you're looking at the market and trying to make trading decisions based on it. Now, the, the leading indicators are defined as indicators that usually, but not always, change before the economy as a whole changes. So a leading indicator is something that's giving you a clue as to what's going to happen in the wider economy. It changes now and, and hopefully predicts uh, a change in, in the wider economy uh, later on, perhaps a month or a couple of quarters uh, down the road. So examples of uh, of data points which are, which are seen as uh, leading indicators would be something like the average weekly hours worked within manufacturing, the every weekly, weekly jobless claims that we just touched on on a previous slide in the US, building permits has been a sign of construction activity and some, you know, and some more sort of esoteric points such as the interest rate spread between the 10 year bond and the federal funds, the short term money market rates in the US. So those are leading indicators in in data points which the market believes give you, uh, you know, a clear insight into which direction an economy is heading. Against that, there are what are known as lagging indicators, and these are defined as indicators that usually change after the economy as a whole does, and typically the lag in between uh, between the change in the economy and and the uh, the leading the lagging indicator is get my teeth in is a few quarters of the year. Uh, now, examples of, uh, of a lagging indicator are, are unemployment rates and, and the ratio of manufacturing and trade inventories to sales. And the reason for their, their lagging indicator is because in both instances, demand in the economy will lead the decision to, for instance, to, for a businessman to go out and employ people to fulfill a new order that he's won. The orders come first, now he needs to increase his production of widgets, he needs to employ new people, it's going to take him a while to do that, he's got to go out and find them, train them, put them into the job. And in terms of his inventory, yes, he's won a new order, he needs to, to acquire more stock, he's got to go on to his suppliers, he's got to, got to wrap his order there, they've got to produce the goods and, and ship them to him. So they are lagging indicators, they're useful to confirm the trends in an economy, but they're not um, going to give you uh, a great deal of insight into what's going on. Some more indications 
of, uh, of lending indicators, ratios of consumer credit to personal income, people's personal financial circumstances change. If, for instance, they've got a, they, they get a new job and they start to, to acquire some money again, they might now feel confident enough to go out and have a loan to have that uh, work done around the house to buy that new car. But conversely, if they've lost their job, then they're going to pull in their horns and they're going to be reducing the amount of money they spend uh, and try and try and get their borrowing down as much as they can, if they can. So uh, these are data points, as I say, that react to after an economy has changed rather than before it. Um, and that's a distinction that we will come back to again, as I say, on Thursday. We'll have a look at some specific examples. But uh, I hope, hope that's been instructive. I think that's probably enough from me for the moment. Um, plenty of it for you to think about there. So if I may, I'll, uh, I'll ask Clive to uh, take up the baton. And I think Clive's talking about uh, some of the aspects of longer term trading this morning. So uh, over to you, Clive. Thanks very much, Dan, as usual. Um, very, very thorough and, um, you know, and, and you know, it's interesting for me to listen to you because um, I think I'm probably guilty myself of maybe um, sort of not giving up on fundamentals, but I don't look at fundamentals quite as much as maybe I should um, because because I concentrate so much on the price action um, and the and the charts. You know, I think it's very difficult to do everything. Can I have the um, share and screen um, thing for me so I can? Um, so I can put my screen up. Is it something like this? Let me have a look. Oh no, I think I just pressed webcam. Actually, I don't think you want to see me, do you? Hello, that's me. But we'll cut that bit off, shall we? <laughs> um, people see you. Sorry, guys. Give us a second. Turn my screen. And let's get the right screen, and then we can get cracking. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you can see my front page, support and resistance part two. Can someone just confirm that for me? That that can be uh, seen on the screen there, and you can hear me fine. And then I shall crack on and do my thing. You how? Is that all good? Right. That was, I think, the last slide we finished with um, on last Thursday, which was um, when I talked about support and resistance, uh, the idea that the market travelled higher with a series of higher highs and higher lows, and then travelled lower with a series of lower highs and lower lows. And this was as defined by Charles Dow back in, um, you know, almost getting on for 100 years ago. Um, and so by knowing where these support and resistance levels are and the important areas where the market's previously bounced from or fallen over from, um, we can gain uh, wisdom that, that can tell us, you know, just purely without knowing anything about the fundamentals, if you like, um, where the market may be going and which direction it may be heading. And this is a little bit to do with my sort of journey, if you like, as a, as a, as a, um, as a broker, trader and an analyst. I used to work on the futures floor with thousands of other people and used to see uh, economic numbers coming out and that's, Darren will tell you, at times um, a number will come out and the market will do pretty much the opposite to what you're looking for and you sort of scratch your head and go, well, hang on a minute, that was a bit of a strange one, that shouldn't have happened. Um, has that ever happened to you, Darren? <laughs> I'm sure it has. Um, and for me, I used to speak to people on the floor and say, well, am I going mad or is that, should that have happened or should, should, should we have done the opposite? And I said, well, you know, yeah, I agree with you, the market, but the market doesn't want to go up at the moment. The market wants to go down. And, um, and that's very much sort of where I, how I ended up just looking at charts because I just decided that I couldn't, um, I wasn't clever enough having left school at 16. Wasn't clever enough to, um, to to work all that stuff out. I'll leave that to cleverer people than me. Um, but I'll just look at the um, price movements because that's the bit that made sense for me. Anyway, I think I went off at a bit of a tangent now. I'll try and get back to, um, to what I'm meant to be talking about. Support and resistance is create and, and the, the, the price of any security, any any forex cross, any you know, anything that you can chart basically. Yeah 
is created by the market, by the collection of players within the market, and bring everybody together and they set the price. And that goes right from short-term traders to long-term traders. And I've tried to sort of do um, you know, a little bit of a, sort of, we've, got, we've got there underneath short-term to long-term, we've got scalpers on one side, people who are just literally trying to buy the ones and sell the twos. That doesn't happen so much in the, in the markets because computers almost do that most of the time. You may have heard of algorithmic trading, and that's very much what the computers do. Then we go to day traders, swing traders, prop traders, hedge fund managers. As we're moving from left to right on that uh, list, right up to sovereign wealth fund managers, guys who manage money for, for countries, um, they're becoming a lot more long term in their outlook. And look, I'll be straight with you. Technical analysis is probably more used at the left-hand side of that list of, um, of uh, market operators, although I am seeing and hearing increased evidence of a lot of people on the right-hand side of that starting to take technical analysis a lot more seriously in the last 10 years or so. Um, and so, you know, everyone's using the charts, uh, you know, but some using it more than others. Obviously, your sovereign wealth fund managers, your pension fund managers are generally more fundamentally based and will be looking at the markets a lot more from the sort of Darren's point of view, if you like. Um, so I'd say as a rule of thumb, short-term traders uh, rely more on technical analysis um, and you can also make a generalization that short-term traders do a lot more trades than uh, your longer-term guys. But obviously, when your long-term guys are trading, they are trading in bigger size, and their orders and what they're thinking about the market may have more of an effect on price overall. But what this collection of everybody all together does is create trends, uh, and that's what I believe is a technical analyst, and that's what we look for. Now, yeah, last time around we looked at examples of how old highs and lows can be can be put on the chart. Yeah, you can just look at those on the chart to try and work out. Uh, where the buyers and sellers may be appearing. Let's try and expand on this idea and look at some other methods of finding potential support and resistance, mainly for longer term time frames. Um, and one of the easiest ones is a trend line, is a trend line analysis. Now, trend lines are quite simply straight lines that join a series of points on the chart. Um, but a lot of, you know, over the years, I've seen a lot of people drawing trend lines incorrectly. Um, so I just want to try and just, um, you know, sort of give you one thing to start with. There is a what's known as a downtrend resistance line, a trend line that is defining a move lower, a move from highs to, to you know, higher prices to lower prices. And what you try and do with a downtrend line is apply it on top of the candlesticks so that it is, you know, and that as you can see from that one, it's a straight line we have uh, hitting here, here and here, that then again hits here and here and here and then breaks around this time here and actually the trend changes at that point and we start to go higher. Um, so that downtrend line, that straight line on the chart defined the, um, the, the move lower and was able to give you opportunities to, to potentially short the market um, at, these, at, these, at these places. So um, I am... Um, right, so, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. That's a downtrend line. Now this next chart, I, I, I'm, I've, shot, I've actually put trend lines on the chart, joining two highs, two lower highs, you know, a, a lower high than the previous one. Here, here we have, um, you know, this this line here joins this high and this high. This high here, this this line here joins that high there and. I don't even know where that joins actually, I think I'm just making it up. Um, so, but, but I think what I'm trying, to, the point I'm trying to make with that particular slide is to say that um, the markets, uh, that you do need three hits to, to give yourself a proper trend line. And um, if you're just joining two lower highs together, then it's a little bit subjective and you can pretty much join in together any two lower highs on the chart. So take care and try and find those those lines where you've got three hits and they're the ones that will generally be more reliable. And I think really the um, the point of this kind of, of, of trend line analysis for me is that markets travel higher and lower with a reasonably um, um, stand, uh, what's the word, standard, standard's not the word, um, but I, 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 
a, 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 you know, they go higher at a steady pace, if you like. Now, I've just gone off the slides for a minute, and I want to show you something on my chart. This is the um, S&P futures um, between June, June 2013 and the start of this month. And we formed what was known as a trend channel with, uh, with you know, joining this line and then translating that line onto the top to say that there was various highs that were, almost, that were getting close to that line as well. And this is what's happened in equity markets recently. Okay, we got to the bottom of that line at the start of October, and then we broke it. Okay, and look at that. We look at the reaction we got when we broke that line. We went straight down from 1925, straight down to 1813. That was, you know, potentially why the market um, sold off sharply during that period. We have made a decent recovery since then. And one thing that um, myself and my analysts were discussing this morning is the idea that we may actually be going back to that line now to test it because one thing you look for with trend lines is the idea that the market can break a line and then come back to retest it and then fail. So a potential roadmap for this market now is back to here and then back down again. And we'll know fairly soon when we get to this area whether that's going to happen or not. We, we can either we'll get to here and see some swift rejection, or we may, or, we, or we'll go through, and that means we'll go back to retest the highs. That's the kind of thing uh, that analysts like myself are using chart to try and make to uh, decide for us. <coughs> so. I just showed you an example of a trend support line. That's a rising line that is joining higher lows. You know, we know our definitions there of a trend. If the lows are getting higher and you can draw a straight line on them, then that straight line can be defining the um, the um, strength of that trend and the direction of travel of that trend. And we can continue to watch that until such a point as it breaks, like it does here. Okay, so which is what we got there. And that's actually a channel as well on that particular slide. Um, just two seconds. Okay, sorry, I'm back now. Um, and one thing that we also showed on that S&P chart was um, the market traveling in channels, which is, a reason, which is an interesting... Um, thing that can happen where markets actually, the highs and the lows, uh, can be a reasonably um, standard and uniform um, type of affair, as you can see here. Okay, And that's actually what I showed you with that S&P chart before. Uh, how are we doing, Tyler? I think we're OK, so let's keep going. No, I've lost my ability to move my slides over. Give us a sec, please. I will be there. I'll get there. Right. Oh, we've got a thunder flash for when we broke the trend line. Nice. OK, and actually one thing to show on that particular slide is the way that the market actually showed an uptick in volume when we broke that particular trend line. I like to see that kind of thing happening uh, because that says to you that you're not the only person that thinks the market may have changed at that particular point. Um, obviously, when you're trading FX markets and whatever platform you're using for your charting, you do not get volume uh, data because there is no central marketplace uh, for FX. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a worldwide market, so that's a bit of a difficult. That can be a difficult situation. So, questions to ask now: What defines the strength of a trend line? Uh, one is the angle. Secondly, the number of hits, and thirdly, the length of time it's been acting as support and resistance. What I'd say about that is, you know, I think the bottom two are fairly obvious. The longer a trend line's been um, defining the market for you. Um, the more you would put store on that. And a uh, number of hits, again, pretty obvious, I think. It's to do with how, um, you know, how, how many times we've hit that line. Angle is actually a bit more interesting. I think you'd probably say that a steep trend line, um, yeah, it would, would, would be a stronger trend line, but that's actually not the case. A, a more shallow trend line has got more chance of... Um, of holding and can often be more reliable than a steep trend line, which is basically going to break at some point. So let's just do a couple. Let's have a look at a couple of charts on the slides here. Here we and and then here's something I like to use when I'm looking at channels. Is 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 what we've got here is 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 we 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 you know we we hit the top line of the channel nicely on these on these uh, rises here, the bottom line here, but then we stopped. 
um, we, we, we failed to reach the top end of the channel on these two particular highs here and then we broke lower and uh, that was the end of that move. I think actually I can show you the same sort of thing happening in the S&P recently and that was again a sign that things were on the wane. We were doing a pretty nice job on that particular um, on that particular market of hitting the highs, you know, the top and the bottom of the channel, and then um, recently we didn't get back to the top of that channel, and that was a warning sign that maybe we were going to break the bottom, which we did. Um, back to the slides. Where are the slides? Where are the slides? Um, let's have a look. Okay. Oh, this was a good one. This was Brent crude oil uh, when we had that big um, snaffle higher back in, um, oh my goodness, when was it now, 2008. And we had a nice gentle trend line here, and then we had a steeper trend line here, and then we broke that trend line. Now, I can tell you, actually, that I was saying to my clients when we, at this point here, at point B, when we broke this trend line, I think we can go back to here. And actually, when we got to here and then started bouncing, I was really quite bullish of um, Brent crude at that point. And I had to, you know, I had to change my uh, my view when we broke below that uh, less uh, steep trend line um, at this time right here. So, you know, it, it's not fail safe. I don't get it right all the time. Uh, the charts are there to guide you. But I tell you what, it does do nicely for me is, yeah, I may have been bullish here. Um, but I wasn't bullish here, and that allowed me to um, change my view. And uh, without um, what's the word? You know, it, 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 it was clearly defined. Okay, I'm wrong. I need to now rethink this. And that's something you can try and do with trading. You can say, where do I think I should buy this or sell this? Um, at what point? At what price level? Am I going to be wrong? and I need to get out of the trade because I am wrong. And I think the charts can do that for you. The nice thing about trend lines for me is, is if you say, okay, we've got this trend line forming here, I'm bullish, I've bought it here because we're, doing, we're, we're, we're traveling above this line, then you can stay with that trade with your stop. You say, I'll get out, I'll be wrong. I'll, that, you know, that, this trend will change if we break this line. So I get out when we break the line here. So you can try and run long trades using a rising trend line as you stop. And you can run short trades using the falling trend line as you stop. You can say, I will stay short and I'll make money if the market goes down. But if we get above this line, then I'm going to change my view. And uh, I'm going to get out of the trade because you don't want to be short anymore. Okay, so overall trend lines define the um, direction of the trend. They can be applied to any time frame. You can put trend lines on 10-minute charts, 5-minute charts, 30-minute charts, hourly, daily, monthly, whatever you like. They can provide you with support and resistance levels and trading opportunity. Um, and I, th I would encourage you to try and draw trend lines on your charts to sort of look for those, um, look for those moments. I wanted to cover one more thing with you today, and I'm going to show you a chart that's relevant to it, that we, that's something, a setup, if you like, that we're looking at right now um, in, uh, here at Futures Text now. Something, and, and, and this relates again to our sort of what we were talking about, about higher highs and higher lows. What happens if you make a high that's the same as the previous high, one? so you hit resistance and then fall over? Well, if you fall over and then break the low between the two highs, you get something called a double top sell signal. And vice versa, if you are in a downtrend, you make a low, then you trade higher again, and then you make an, a, a low that's the same as the previous one. When you break the high between the two lows, you get a buy signal. That's a double bottom buy signal. And I'm going to show you, because it's much better to do it with live markets, isn't it? Okay, let's do it. We haven't got this signal yet, but we are watching it, and we are waiting to see it. It's in the Australian dollar. Okay, and the Aussie dollar has basically traded down to 86.43, traded up to 89.00, traded all the way back to 86.52 again, only nine pips difference between that low and that low. And so for me, if we were to break above 89.00, we get this clear, clean buy signal. And one thing you can do with these is measure. You can say, well, 86.43 to 89.00, is uh, is you know is is, is whatever it is, <laughs> 250 ticks, and so if we add 250 ticks to where we where we get the buy signal, 
we got a potential target of 91.57. Okay, um, so that's what I'm saying. That's an if trade at the moment. We have not got that signal yet, but we are saying that if we were to break above 89.00 for the Aussie dollar, then the signal is that we can go to 91.50. And patient, um, trading is a lot about patience and um, that particular trade, we have got another pattern actually called a diamond which I haven't got on this chart but that, that might give us a slightly earlier signal. Um, but um, what we're, you know, that's what we're looking for. We're not jumping into that trade right now because we haven't got that signal yet. We are waiting to see. You know, for me, we've got a setup, we've got a potential trade, we wait for the trigger for that trade and we're not doing anything until we get that trigger. In fact, there's the diamond. If we look at the one hour chart, you can see that it's actually forming some sort of diamond thing here. We've been watching this for a while and it failed there um, overnight at the top of that diamond. So we're still waiting for, you know, we, we, get, we get a small buy signal if we break here on the hourly and then we get a bigger buy signal on the, um, on the daily and the hourly if we break above 89.00. I don't know what's going to trigger that fundamentally. Um, I'm just, and I don't know whether, whether it's going to be triggered. Um, but I will wait to see if we get that particular signal. Um, I think we're, um, let me see, have I got, so that's double tops right, can, I just, can I just ask a question? Yeah, go for it though. Um, on that break, do, are you happy with it just to be, for it to, to break once, or do you want to see it sustained over a number of days or whatever the time frame that you're looking at the chart is? Or is one, is one, you know, one breach of the levels sufficient? I often quite, um, I, I will go down to smaller time frames to see what's going on. If I see that break very cleanly on a 30 minute or 60 minute chart, or there's something else on those charts that can coincide with it to say to you, yes, this is really, you know, if, if, if it looks like a break and feels like a break, then it's a break sort of thing. Whereas if it breaks uh, and it's a bit messy, then you might want to um, be a little bit more careful, not put on so much size, and wait, as you say, for maybe a day or two's confirmation. Sometimes with these things, you get a pull back to the um, to to the to the level, the breakout level. So, um, for example, on this chart, if we broke here, do we go higher and then come back to here, and then break 89.00, and then maybe come back to 89.00, and that kind of thing. So, I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to that. It depends on your time frame. It depends on your risk tolerance. But I think what you've got to try and do is is to watch the price action on a more micro level to tell you whether it's the real deal or whether it's something that's 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 going to be a little bit more um, you know, harder to to just jump on, if you like. Okay. Thank you, Clive. Yeah. No worries. Um, let me just. I think there's. You know, we had. There's something, here is, um, here's a chart that I wanted to show you the trend lines we're watching on the dollar index. So this is the, you know, this, this, this can give us some, Darren was talking about the dollar earlier and the way that uh, there's a lot of people that are positioned um, for a stronger dollar and I think we can see why this is the dollar against the basket of currencies. This is, a, this is a, something you can trade in the futures picks in Chicago and, um, and you can see the rising trend in those, okay? And today we've actually made, we've created a third hit, one, two, three, uh, with, this, um, with this trend support line. Now, we've now got a trend support line or something that we can use as a reference there. Um, but actually, on this time frame, we have a high, a low, a lower high, and a lower low. So you could argue that that's a downtrend. And obviously, 84.50 is is one. And you know, our trend our trend line there uh, is is probably more important and more of a def definer of the trend. But if we were to break the trend line and then to break 84.50, then we are definitely actually moving lower now in that. Uh, dollar index, and that would give us a very clear signal of, uh, of the market's intent. Um, I don't know whether I've got another chart that I was going to show you. This is a bit of a messy one. This is a euro against the US dollar, which is a current, you know, currency pair that is um, sort of uh, confusing a few people at the moment. We're looking at, you know, if we were to look at that on a daily time frame. Uh, we see something that's been travelling lower in a channel and is now potentially trying to form a, a channel to the upside, and um, that's on a daily time. That you know that that chart there is the daily, 
Okay, and you can see we're now testing the bottom of that line. So that's somewhere around 127. Let's see, 127.50 at the moment, and the low today is 127.58 at the moment. So that's interesting to see whether we are going to hold. So I'll put that. I'll make that chart big again. So I'm looking. That's that's for me the big thing today that I'm looking at is euro US dollar going to hold 127.50. Um, and keep us in this um, this this new de newly developing rising trend. Um, I think that having looked at some current charts with respect to what we've actually um, covered, um, you know, on the slides, I think I'll stop. I'll, I'll kick off the slides now and call it a day. I don't know whether Darren, have you got any other things you might want to um, share? Any thoughts you've got at all? Well, only that we, you know, that as we, that really, we, we remain in very interesting times. I think, you know, we, it's interest, very interesting that chart on dollar index, and so as is the euro dollar chart. To be fair, both of those are, are interesting levels to watch. Um, you know, and the macro data that comes out, now, you know, over over the next week is is also going to be key because it, it's going to directly influence sentiment. So there's there's plenty for us to be watching. Um, there's plenty for us to be talking about on Thursday. So yeah, once again, people, be careful in the markets. But you know, but, but do try and take some of the things we've talked about today uh, and over the course of the other webinars and apply them. And obviously, if you do have any questions, please make them known to Mihail and Clive and I will be very happy to try and answer them uh, uh, if we can. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, and being with you again on Thursday morning. Yeah, sure. Just to mirror what Darren said there, be careful. It isn't a time to be trying to hit home runs. Uh, there's a lot of volatility in the markets, and, and um, you know I, I don't know whether I said this in the last webinar because it is something I've been banging on about all for about a week now to anyone that listened. Um, the markets will still be there tomorrow uh, and the next day and the next week, and uh, da 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 da. da. <laughs> you know I can go on. There is no need to try and um, yeah I think by using the baseball analogy, don't try and hit home runs. Um, make sure you're still in the game next week. These are some hopefully fairly sound advice. Okay, Mihal, I think me and Super Daz are done for the day. You want to take over again, sir? Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Clive. Thank you very much, Super Daz. And thank you all for participating in our webinar. Our next webinar will be hosted next Thursday at 1 o'clock UK, at 11 o'clock UK time. We'll see you there. Thank you very much for being with us.